welcome back to my shed. My name is Paul Hopewell. I make all sorts of parts and components in my workshop while showing you the process and the techniques I use along the way. Firstly, I want to say hi to all of my subscribers and say thank you for your continued support. And to suggest to those who've just found my channel to subscribe and click on the bell. And, if you're really happy with the contents, click on the thumbs up. Please leave any comments or suggestions, especially if there's anything you'd like to see. In today's video I'm going to show you how I designed and built a prototype thread cutting tool that's mechanically activated to retract the cutting tip away from the thread and away from any approaching face. And I hope you enjoy watching the process that I've gone through to produce this device. This is only a prototype and I've left it open for anyone to copy or improve. A while ago I made a stub shaft with various offset diameters, threads terminating besides shoulders or faces at each end, like the one you see here. As you all know one of the worst things you can do is ruin the material while doing something as mundane as a thread in the final operation of a job. So to reduce the potential for any ensuing catastrophe, I resorted to hand cranking the chuck to get the threading done. Here for example, I'm cutting a 1mm pitch thread with no particular diameter. Just to show you that the closer the threading tool gets to the side face, the pucker factor, starting at a mere pinch, during the approach to a shoulder increases to involuntary bowel movement at an exponential rate. In that case, what do you think is going to happen if the RPM in this case is raised from 150 RPM to 1000 RPM? At that rate the cutter is moving at about 1 metre a minute. And let's face it, there's only one of two things that's going to happen. That was only 700 RPM. I spent a bit of time and effort searching the internet in the vain hope of finding a tool that best suited my needs. I found a few bits and bobs, but uh, the only ones I found that were made by tool makers for their own use and nothing by way of a DIY or a buy it now. So I resorted to etching it out on paper and, and having a go at designing one. My idea was to have the insert cutter retract away from the material and the approaching face at an angle equal to the back face of the insert and thread face. The tool mount must of course be a Dixon type mounting. Here are the other components on another piece of paper. The rest of the drawings are in the waste paper bin. Lots of it. I used a program called Algodoo to help simulate my retracting unit and I found a few problems that had to be addressed before manufacturing process had started. After a few simulations I found by boring a small hole down the inside of the ram and inserting a spring and a lollipop plunger the green load lever always returned to the resting position and the, as a byproduct the ram was dampened when the trigger was released. So, with the process thought out and simulated, I set about digging up all the material in my scrap bin to find material that best suited the requirements. The main body is made of mired steel. The cap is from 10mm thick stainless steel. The tool ram, or insert holder, is made of cold rolled steel. Uh, the link lollipop, uh, the lever assemblies are all made of mild steel and the remaining items were bits with origins I couldn't even begin to describe. After cutting the material for the main block, uh, as you can see here I mounted it in the mill, uh, squared it up, trued it up to something roughly what I required um, according to the drawing. Those who've seen my Dixon tool holder video will uh, see this bit of video as familiar. However, what isn't quite so familiar is the fact that the block that I've cut and shaped won't fit in this uh, tilting vise. So I'm going to have to uh, think about this. What 
what I've chosen to do is to draw an outline on the block, the shape of the tool, and then see how I can reduce the block. And as you can see here, there's a large wedge in one corner, just about this point here, that will allow me to take a section out. So if I put one of the previous Dixon holders in there and etch a sort of line around it, I can, uh, I can cut that piece out and it will fit in the vise. And after bluing and uh, marking everything out, you can see here um, the, the, the line that will carry the angle uh, of the ram and uh, just here and uh, the cutout. This next bit of video is probably going to take a little while so the best thing to do is just stamp on the accelerator and uh, speed it up a bit for a while. This part is where I cut out the rectangular section. Uh, this will enable me to put it in the vise so that I can continue with the next section. You'll probably notice when I operate the hand wheel in the background that I'm wearing welding gloves. That's because the turnings are coming off that hot and fast. Uh, it will burn him. Now I can get on with the task of copying the uh, two grooves and the slots and various other operations in the tiltable vise. This is the 11mm deep main slot. And I'm finishing off the uh, main parts of the slot using the uh, T-cutter. After checking everything with a vernier, I was uh, happy with everything on that, so that's the T-slot done. Now I'm setting up the tilting vise uh, first on the X-plane of the uh, milling machine, and then I will roughly set it to 45 degree tilt. I had a problem with one of my SD cards and lost quite a lot of video. Some bits I used from other videos, this is one. But this gives you an idea of what I did to set the cutter in the right place for cutting the main body. The only variation between what you see here and what I did for the prototype is that I placed gauge blocks underneath the Dixon tool holder to raise it to the same height as the top of the prototype main body thus ensuring a good copy. Now the tilting vise was set to the tool holder on gauge blocks, so before I started to cut the grooves in the new block, I used a 45 degree checking gauge to confirm that the faces coincided with each other, and I got them less than a thou, which is pretty good. With being satisfied with the settings, I decided to get on with it and cut the grooves and get them done. As you can imagine, after I'd done the um, grooves and cut them, I did try them on the tool post, and uh, again, it fitted quite well, very well indeed. After much deliberation I decided to mill a bit more off the width of this main body because it just seemed too bulky and too heavy. So uh, I decided I can uh, take another 5mm off. Now that I'm happy uh, with the width of the body I've marked it out ready to have the 30 degree um, ram angle face machined and of course the top and the bottom or the back and the front or whatever you want to call it uh, faces as well. Uh, here the uh, I've just started the operation to remove the majority of the waste material on the back. Now 
This is the same back face, it's just had most of the material removed and it's nearly finished. Turning the body upside down in the vise, uh, I was able to machine at right angles both end faces. Now I've started the main slot, that's the slider slot for the ram. I'm, I'm calling the ram a ram because basically that's the action it's going to make. It's in and out sliding, but it'll be in um, a transition fit. Here I'm using gauge blocks to check that I don't exceed 15 millimeters width. Surface grind in the top and bottom faces is a bit of a waste of time. Aesthetically, it makes it look better. It's always a good idea to make sure that the magnet uh, and anything placed upon it is very clean and flat. For making sure that there aren't any raised dinks or scratches on either surfaces I use a uh, precision stone to make sure they're nice and clean. This face is cleaned up to accept the cap. The slot will also be ground all over to achieve squareness and parallel. But, just as importantly, it must be a smooth finish. After grinding these top faces, I set the cutting wheel in the centre of the slot to cut the throat depth to 15mm. Then, to clean the top and bottom faces, I dress the wheel aggressively to allow me to sneak up on the side cuts without burning any material. I use the marked out cap to set the eight holes in the body, thereby pilot drilling both parts in one go. The eight holes in the body were drilled out and hand tapped to M6. I was acutely aware of the fact that drilling and tapping operation here could cause bruising on the inside ground faces unless I took great care. Now it's time to get on with the ram. For this I'm using a bit of cold drawn steel and if you remember this is the it's only a prototype so I use whatever material I could find to do the job. This is the second place that my SD card lost video but I've got nothing else in its place to show how I did the 30 degree side face or the tips neutral rake angle recess and the 3BA threaded uh, hole. However, I did capture the final side of the surface grinding operation to complete the sizing of the ram. You've probably noticed that the centre finder shows up two different centres here. That's because I decided to make the slot in the main body slightly deeper 
in order to prevent the ram from being put in the slot facing the wrong way. Uh, I must admit I'm not exactly patting myself on the back for that idea. The ramp, as you can see here, is mounted in a tool holder between two 20 thou copper packers to prevent damage while it's being held. After truing up, the end is spot face and then pilot drilled. For this size I've only got a quarter inch reamer so I used a 6mm drill to allow a little under 13 thou for reaming. Then it was time to drill and tap one 6mm hole in the side of the ram for the pin. The pin's got two jobs to do. One, allow the spring to pull the ram away from the workpiece and two, to restrict the movement of the ram to no more than 20mm. The cap is made from stainless steel bar and if I knew now at this point what I'd found out later I'd have gone out and bought some flat mild steel bar because all my cutting tools needed replacing or resharpening after cutting this stuff. This was shown earlier covering the main body and these holes were opened out to 6mm with a, a deep countersunk recess to keep the 8 screws from protruding into the workspace. I used my homemade uh, edge finder to find the centre of the slot and used a 6mm drill to uh, drill a hole through so that I could do the slot uh, with a reasonable amount of care. Uh, it is stainless steel so it's going to take a bit of cutting. I cut the 6mm slot using a 5mm two flute cutter, then ran down both sides to clean up the slot. The trigger and load lever are going to pivot from the same point using a 6mm fitting bolt. The gap at this point is to be 15mm wide with both sides ending up at about 10mm thick. However, the 5mm cutter was well worn by this time and the gap was a pretty poor finish and it wasn't very true either so I decided to finish this with a file later. Now it's time to tidy up the 50mm gap using the file. The 50mm wide load lever had to be made half a millimetre wider, allowing for the poor finish in the pivot gap to be wider after it is cleaned up. The smaller and longer slot from the 15mm gap towards the main body was designed to be 5mm. And indeed it ended up as 5mm wide using a 4mm wide cutter, despite earlier altering my design to take it to a 6mm wide slot. But as the 5mm cutter decided to burn out, I, uh, I'm stuck with 5mm, so I would have to grind the, um, the trigger lever down to 5mm thick from 6mm. Still, at least the 15.5mm wide load lever body fits quite nicely now. The lollipop is so called because of its apparent shape when the machining's finished. It's got four jobs to do. One, it connects the load lever to the ram for setting the cut. Two, when the load lever is released, the load lever returns to the starting or resting position. Three, when the ram is triggered, 
it acts like a damper preventing the inevitable mechanical thump. And four, having a sprung and dampened load lever prevents the load lever from snapping back and potentially breaking fingers. After machining the lollipop spindle to size, using a quarter inch reamed hole in the ramp as a gauge, I used an old tool ground to a small arc to machine a 12mm ball on one end. Using the milling machine, I removed 3.5mm off each side of the lollipop. Off camera, I also drilled a 6mm hole through. The 15.5mm wide part of the load lever was drilled as was the cap so that the 6mm fitted bolt could be fitted and this was also done off camera. The two components were fitted together and mounted in the milling vise and it was loaded with a 5mm four flute cutter. The mill vise only clamped on the 15.5mm lever body in a way that allowed the 6mm fitting bolt to be removed but only after the 5mm slot cutter passed through the 5mm slot without binding or recutting on the main cap. It was fine in this case and then the bolt and cap was removed to complete the slot all round the lever base. Part of the slot is to keep the trigger lever in place and aligned. The other part of the slot is widened to 6mm to allow the 6mm wide or thick lever extension to be brazed on. I cut both levers from this one piece of 6mm thick plate, dressing them up later on the belt sander. I used a screw locked in the vise to hold the load lever base in place. Then prepared everything for brazing. I've never brazed with a propane torch before now. I would much rather have brazed with oxyacetylene than propane, but it worked fine. It looks a bit tatty, but it's well held. This is the trigger lever. Thanks again to the SD card I didn't get the grinding footage but here it is being hardened or simulated hardening because I only got between 40 and 45 Rockwell. It's better than plasticine anyway. I did the same to the lollipop end of the ram and achieved with that a 45 to 50 Rockwell. This little bit is the link that connects the load lever to the lollipop. Before I got down to making it, uh, I made a few temporary ones using 6 inch nails cut down and bent into a U-shape. With the unit fully assembled, the U-shaped nailed segments simulated the link before choosing how far the whole centres in the link needed to be. The link also had to be a Y-shape, looking at it from its widest dimension. So that meant cutting another slot and another couple of bits off each side. And because it was a tiny little thing, I used the handsaw, vice and file method of construction. After all, it is only a prototype, uh, just to see how effective the whole device would be. The trigger retraining clip is uh, an old spring clip, reshaped and drilled to fit. Not without fault though, the drill found its way offline on one hole. Not a problem, I'll just drill the corresponding hole in the cap to suit. All I have to do now is drill and tap two more holes in the cap and that's it, job done for this bit. Stainless steel, especially stuff this thick, is a bit hard to drill and tap. So I used a slightly bigger tapping drill to help prevent breaking the 4mm tap. I just had to say it, didn't I? The lineup. Main body, even more modified cap, lollipop, the link, 
reshape trigger, ram, load lever, trigger clip, center adjusting nut and extended scrub screw, lollipop spring, bed spring, spring anchors and screws. You'll probably notice that the 15.5mm gap has been deepened. This was because the load lever needed to rotate slightly further round. Not by much, but I took more out to prevent me having to do it again if there was still an issue later. I've left the broken tap in it um, working a bit as a pathetic dowel pin against the uh, small trigger clip. It's a shame really that I didn't get the video for this end of the ram or insert holder. I surface ground the ram to fit the main body mindful of the material that I'd put aside for the ram. The maximum amount of play is no more than one thou. I couldn't make it any smaller than this because with, with, with oil in it it slowed the ram down and if I do that I'd need a stronger spring to pull it back. I, honestly, I could feel a resistance with just paraffin as a lubricant. The 5mm trigger um, fits nicely in the cap without rattling around and because of various restrictions it's not moved about much anyway. I've replaced the lollipop spring with one twice as long as the original one to overcome the vacuum that uh, returns the load lever back to its parking position. It parks it a bit quicker than it was when I first tested it. When I finished the little Y-shaped link, I half expected it to sprain the lollipop, doing part uh, from the side loading, but so far it's working faultlessly. The pins that hold the mainspring are 6mm bolts that have been turned to size and then slotted with a hacksaw. The spring however is nothing more than a bed spring. It had to be shortened uh, to get it to fit and making the new loop at one end was as bad as much fun as wrestling with a bunch of monkeys. Well here it is sitting in the desired angle of 30 degrees off the thread axis to ensure that it clears without wiping the trailing face of the thread. It also means I don't have to uh, alter the tool post as well. The recess was cut to allow the cutting edge of the insert to be flush with the top of the ram and the ram slides at 60 degrees to the working axis. The back face of the insert sits at 90 degrees to the ram's axis. I used a bit of junk aluminium, well skip fodder, um, and while I was cutting it to length I also shortened the load lever as well. I very roughly cut clearance slots underneath it to clear the angled bed slides to prevent any damage. Uh, it's held in place using one 8mm bolt and an underplate. Uh, as you can see it uh, wraps neatly around the front of the lathe head. After cutting another bit of aluminium, bin waste, and uh, bending a bit of 8mm bar, I set about drilling and tapping various places to get the items to fit together, with the purpose of making the whole thing fully adjustable, and without interfering with any of the other controls, the closest of which is the lathe motor speed controller. This is the first dummy run, I suppose, just to satisfy myself that it does actually do something after all that. I suppose there becomes a time in one's life that one just has to bite the bullet. And this is it. You know it's got to work but a very small part of you still puckers up very tightly as the half knots are engaged, especially for your first time at 300 RPM. 
that little bit of me sort of squealed a little bit at 700 rpm. Positively whistled at 1000 rpm. All is well and it's a really nice finish. Thanks for watching.